Hi there, I'm hey. Julie Riley. I'm Dave Riley. And we're Chefs Just of, of the, the future. future. So welcome to our class today. It's uh, January 15th. Great time to do a little soup. Soup and sandwich. And it's a perfect. hot sandwich, yeah, great combination. Nice hot sandwich. So we're gonna be making a chicken corn chowder. Now this recipe, you could do it without the, the dairy in it, without the cream to lighten it up if you don't want a heavy, heavy soup. Actually, any soup. They all kind of start out the same. Just adjust it. If there's things in the recipe you don't like, for instance, we don't particularly care for red peppers, so we're going to omit them. Right. And on the long lines, though, that thinking, if you don't want a chowder, which involves the cream that we're going to use in this recipe, you can make it a broth-style soup. We just st strictly use vegetable broth or chicken broth in this case. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be using half and half. Mm -hmm. You could make it lighter with milk. You could make it lighter with skim milk. You can make it even lighter with just broth. And you can make it richer by using heavy cream instead of half and half. Yeah, it's very versatile. So. There's a lot of ways you can do this. Yes, and uh, the second is our sandwich. Monte Cristo. Monte Cristo. So um, we'll be getting into that a little later. I'll tell you a little bit about the history of the Monte Cristo. And it's just great. Soup and soup and sandwich. All right, so from our kitchen to yours with, with creativity and love, let's get cooking. Fantastic. So the first part of the recipe says to chop all of your vegetables, your corn, your celery, onions, mince your garlic, cube your chicken. The corn, you can use fresh corn, canned corn, or frozen corn. So we're gonna use frozen corn tonight. All right. Just showing you the vegetables that we pre-cut. Part of this uh, preparation, the French call it in culinary kitchen terms, it's called mise en place. That means everything in its place. So if you can get this master, you can make cooking so much more fun and so much more organized. You have all your ingredients divided and ready to go. We diced our potatoes and put them in cold water so they don't brown. And I'm gonna strain them off because they're gonna go in a pot now with chicken stock, correct? Yes. I'm gonna pour a quart of chicken stock into my pan. So what we're doing here is we're actually saving, saving an extra dirty pot. We're trying to do this in one pot. So why don't you explain what we're doing as far as potatoes and stock? Up. Right. So we're gonna um, we're gonna cook the potatoes in the chicken stock instead of cooking it in the soup because it would take a little bit longer in the soup with the cream and everything else. That is correct. And we also, um, you know, we just want the and we don't want the potatoes to get all mushy either. That's very important. You don't want a mushy potato in your chowder. So I'm going to put this on the stove on high and wait till it comes to a boil, and then we're going to reduce the heat. So roughly how much chicken stock I, was that? That was one quarter chicken stock. One quarter chicken stock to about one large and one half large potato, one and a half potatoes. Yeah, it looks like about almost two cups, about two cup cups. and a half to two cups of potatoes. And again, it doesn't have to be perfect. If you're off by a teaspoon or a tablespoon, your recipe is not going to change. <laughs> exactly, like the corn. I mean, I think I put down two cups of corn, but if a can is only 15 ounces, don't worry about that little bit extra. One can is fine. So, um, Ideally, back to the corn, I think Mrs. Riley might have mentioned it already, but in case not, when choosing the corn, the best, obviously, is to go with corn on a cob, fresh corn. The next, in my personal experience, is frozen corn. And then the last choice would be can, canned corn. Only because canned corn is packed with a lot of preservatives and, and sodium. So in our pot, we're going to put a couple of tablespoons of olive oil. Okay. Uh, we're going to turn it on to, I, I guess, high. I have We have an induction burner, so this cooks really fast. So the process that we're going to use, and David did remind me, I'm going to throw the carrots in first because carrots take longer to cook than everything else over here. The corn just has to be heated up. It's at the ends. All right, so let's go down. That's a great idea to mention what pecking order we're going to go in. Go with the carrots first, because mm -hmm. they do take the longest. Even though we have our diced raw chicken, I would put the diced raw chicken in next. Do you agree, Kerr? Sure, yes. And then after that, I would, I would leave the corn for last, like Mrs. Riley said, and I'd put oh, the yeah. onion, the celery, and the garlic all together. That would be after the chicken goes in. 
And if you do it this way, your chicken really shouldn't stick to the bottom of the pan. Some people, if they put the chicken in first, it might stick at the bottom, make a little bit of a mess, and pull the meat apart. You don't want that. Mm. Dave, tell everybody what this combination is. Okay, yeah, this is a classic French term called mirepoix, and it's three vegetables. It's diced carrot, diced celery, and diced onion. That's called a standard mirepoix. And I most, I'm sorry, most sauces, most soups, most stock, stock start with this mirepoix. Everything starts with that. And down south, uh, New Orleans, they uh, use peppers. They use peppers in their mix. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Okay. So here we go. The oil is hot. I can tell already it's got little waves in it. We don't want it to smoke for this. We just want to want it to be hot. And you can hear that little... You can hear it sizzle. Okay. When do you start seasoning? I like to season right in the beginning with the carrots and the meat. So after the meat goes in, we'll hit it with... That's a great time. And this yeah. particular chowder recipe, we'll wait till the meat goes in. Remember, everything that you're putting on here is going to continue to cook as we add each new ingredient to it. Good point. Mm-hmm. Give it about a minute and a half. I think I'm going to go ahead and add my chicken. Perfect timing. And I want to make sure that I stir it right away. Stir it right away because the chicken has a tendency to it would stick on the bottom of the, the pan. So I'll let you season as I what is that? I have a little tri mix here, just like you try uh, mirepoix. I have a tri mix of garlic powder, salt, and a little black pepper. I'm gonna sprinkle that in. For chowders, I don't like using any, what, what, what I call a white chowder, consists of cream. So I don't like using any, like, uh, you know, really hot spices. And again, when you're seasoning, it's, there's no uh, set rule as to what your flavor is, what you like, how much you like. Now, my chicken is a little pink, but these pieces were really small. If you were using bigger pieces, you would show. wait until... Yeah, you would wait until it um, it turned white, but since we're going to continue to cook... And it's not sticking to the pan either. And the pieces of chicken are so small, I'm just going to go ahead and wait till it sizzles again. These induction burners work pretty well. Oh, you have to hit start. Yeah, hit start. <laughs> I did that one time on a video too, and I'm standing at the pot looking at it like, the where's the noise? Where's the movement? There's nothing. And Mrs. Riley comes by, she goes, oh, try hitting start. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. I hope everybody is well. All right. Now the garlic's going to go in. Our so that was a cup of uh, carrots. This was about, what, two clo two or three cloves of garlic? Two cloves of garlic. Alright. Mm. And this is a cup of onions that are chopped. Again, maybe it was like a half of a medium onion? Half of a medium onion, correct. Mm -hmm. Now again, like we said in the beginning of this process, yes, please follow the recipe as a standard guide. But if you happen to like all the flavor of onion and carrots, you can definitely add more. It's not going to ruin it. It's only going to enhance it. So. Right. And a cup of celery. So what I would add, because I, I do love celery and chowder, mm. I would probably add a little celery salt to this, a celery seed. That's a good key when doing chowders that require celery in a recipe, a little celery salt. It's, oh, a, it's a, a spice. Okay. Celery seeds will work. They're, mm. they're on a fine side, right? They're, not they're very fine. Yeah. Perfect, perfect. You don't want them too large, like sesame seeds, because huh? that would stand out in your soup. Huh? Right. It wouldn't look right, and it wouldn't the texture when you eat it wouldn't be right. Although some of the recipes I looked up, because I, I love comparing recipes, um, and some of the recipes I looked up did have, like, thick herbs in it, like thyme and, you know, Absolutely. basil and... See, that's the difference. A little, a little trick of the kitchen science here. When dealing with dry spices, you want to add them in the beginning, like we said earlier. If you can sweat them on a dry heat to, to release their oils with dry spices. When dealing with fresh herbs, it's just the opposite. You want to fold them in towards the end. If you put them in the beginning, they kind of have a tendency to burn and get a little bitter. And it kind of ruins, it doesn't come out as strong as it would as you fold it in the end. 
Mm. Trust me on that. It's a, it's a good tip. Our, our potatoes are boiling because they, uh, they do have to cook for about how long? Seven minutes or Maybe so? seven minutes, but you want to, once it comes to a boil, make sure the stock is reduced to a simmer because the boiling uh, movement can break the potatoes up and make them all mushy. And that's the last right. thing you want. We're going to add that corn later, right? Yeah, if we don't, the reason why we won't, we won't add the corn now is that too, like a potato, might break up and disintegrate. Get mushed. That's one of your items you want to fold in towards the end. So I don't know if you can see what it looks like. Nice and colorful, green, white, and orange. Gonna add We're going to add our butter next. Perfect. So now in this pot, we have a little bit of oil we started with. We have a little bit of moisture that came out of the chicken and vegetables and the butter we just added. Now we need that flavor and liquid to do our next step, which is make a what? What is it called? Well, it's like a roux. It is a roux. <laughs> well, I thought a roux was just butter and flour. But well, it is, it's a roux with the mirepoix added to it already. Right, this is like a <laughs> shortcut, you know, a real quick way instead of doing the roux separate from everything else. Exactly. This is a, a quick way to make a soup. And mm -hmm. now this step we're going to do next in a couple of minutes when we add the flour. Again, a kitchen term that the French use is we're going to sange. We're going to sange the soup. That means we're going to dust with flour to make mm -hmm. our roux. So I want my butter to melt. I guess you could do this with olive oil, a little more olive oil if you didn't want all that butter. You know what, you absolutely absolutely could make a roux without the use of butter. We happen to like the flavor of butter in this particular recipe, so we're going with the butter. But if you just want to strict, strictly stick to a healthier oil or substitute, you can still make a roux. Right. And um, if you're just doing the broth one, you don't even need to do the butter and the flour. You would just... And in case we didn't mention it, a roux is equal parts of butter and equal parts of flour. And it turns into a paste as you add heat to it. And that's your thickening agent. That's what makes the chowder, the consistency thick, like a glue, if you will. Mm -hmm. A roux is a glue. That was, what, a half a cup? Mm -hmm. A stick of butter? Yep. No, that wasn't a stick of butter. That was like uh, two large tablespoons. Oh, so this is. Yeah, you so you can start off. Flour. You start off. Always start off with less flour if you're not sure, because you can always add. Start off with too much flour, you know what's going to happen? It's too thick and too clumpy. Now the only thing is, I just want to make sure my potatoes are almost done. Right. Before so let's we do this, because once we add the flour to this, it's going to get very pasty, mm -hmm. and we're going to want to add our broth to it right away. Now in this recipe, we're going to use a cream. Like we said earlier, you can use milk, or you can omit the cream entirely and make it like more of a broth soup. A stocky soup. Well, we're using cream. So when Mrs. Riley, when the potatoes are done, Mrs. Riley's going to take that chicken stock that potatoes we're cooking in, and we're going to fold it into this pot that will have our roux, and it'll it'll thin it down a roux. It'll make it the consistency we're looking for. After that, we're going to take our cream and add it back to the potatoes. And this is really important. When you're making a roux, and you want to add hot liquids to it, your stock or your cream, you want to make sure they're hot or at the very, very least warm. You never ever, trust me on this one, you never ever want to add a cold liquid or cold stock because what will happen with your flour and butter, it'll never dissolve. It'll never mix it evenly. You'll get little clumps of balls of flour and butter and nah, that's not good. So for this recipe, we did take out our, our, our uh, half and half ahead of time. Yes. And it's been sitting out for a couple of hours. Good so point. So at, yeah. at least it's room temperature. At least it's room temperature, So I right. am adding this into here because the potatoes are cooked. All right, great. They are. They, they didn't they take were long. Cut, no, because they were, they were diced. And he made like a one-inch dice. Well, something we should have mentioned too, the mirepoix, the chicken, the celery, carrots, onion, potatoes were all cut around the same size as best as I could, as best as you can. You keep them all the same size in a uniform, things cook, uh, they balance out evenly when you're cooking. So we just put that cream in, it got hot right away, it's not boiling and that's okay, we really don't want it to boil. So, okay, so the next step is the flour. The we're going to sanje, we're going to dust the roux and the chicken with flour. And you stir it, as you're doing it, you stir so that you don't get big clumps of flour. You know, you don't want it all lumpy. Now there are some recipes that you just dust your chicken ahead of before you start to saute it. You think that's enough or? I'll tell you by the feel. I can feel just from consistency. 
little bit more. I think we're going to go with a little bit more, yes. Mm -hmm. And at this stage, when you're dusting your mirepoix and chicken and butter with flour, you're making your roux, after you get enough flour in it and you're happy with the consistency, you want to cook it for a minute or two. Because if you don't cook that flour taste off, it will show up at the end of the recipe. It'll be... Gritty. Yeah, gritty. And you taste the flour. Taste the flour at right. the end. You don't want to taste flour it's at the like end. It's like when you make just a butter and flour roux, you cook it. And you cook it for two minutes. All right, let me show you what I have here because we're, we're right on point. In fact, we're going to lower the heat. Oh, even more. There's a little bit of a film on the bottom of the pan. I don't know if you can see because there's a glare. It's not burnt. It's not stuck, but it's starting a little bit of a film. That's the flour and the gluten coming out. That's what we want. That's what we're looking for. And then when you take a spatula and you, and you press it, it kind of sticks together like stuffing. That's when we're ready but for the hot. glue glue. That's when we're ready for hot liquid. Okay. Yeah, you know, if I do this carefully, I mean, even if a potato or two gets in... It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. So we don't even have to dirty the strainer. So I'll pour, and you stir. When you have two people, it's easier. All right, at this point, before we do it, liquid's hot, ready to go in. The roux is hot. We lowered the heat, but we don't want to eliminate the heat. We want a little bit of heat on there, because we need to continue cooking this flour as the milk and stock goes in. All right, let's do this. All right, so I'm doing little bits. Go ahead. Perfect. And then you just keep folding it around, and you'll you'll notice the roux will start to dissolve. Mm -hmm. You become more of like a thick liquid, and that's yeah, what you're looking for. Yeah, it'll look a little gluey. And then from yeah. there, it'll tighten up again. It'll get thick again, and you'll think, oh, what did I do wrong? Well, we haven't added all the liquid yet, so you didn't do anything wrong. Right. We're adding a little bit at a time. And this prevents it from getting the lumps off also, doing a little at a time. Yeah, we should have no lumps in this, no flour lumps at all in the soup because of the procedure of what we followed. Now, I'm telling you right now, this mixture right now, as it is with maybe a little bit more milk, is basically substitute the celery for, for peas and it's a pot pie filling. It's many things. You know what you just touched base Chicken on? Alicane. This is like a bechamel sauce, which mm -hmm. is one of the main five mother sauces, which is made with milk and flour and roux and butter. Mm -hmm. And from there, you can make all kinds of things. You can make Alfredo sauce by adding cheese. Mm -hmm. You can make what Mrs. Riley just said. So now look at this consistency. It's like very, very, very it's, creamy. Yeah, it's very creamy, but we're not done. We're going to keep adding it because as it cooks, it's going to reduce. Right. Oh, yeah. All right, so you notice I put a little bit more in that time because it's soupy now. And what he, the stirring, you don't have to really stir it that much. He just has to mix it together. Make sure it's the same consistency because that's what happens. Some spots get lumpy. And now I'm just going to go with the rest of it, with the potatoes and all. Everything, perfect. Now Beautiful. here's a little kitchen tip. Everything's in this pot right now except for the corn. Just note that your potatoes tend to give off a little starch, even though we pre-cooked them, pre-blanched them, if you will. So you might want to thin this down if it's too thick by the time you fold the corn in, and you'll know when you fold the corn in what consistency you're looking for. If it's too thick, you can always add more stock, or you can add more, more right. cream. Right. Well, we cook the potatoes in the stock, so the starch is, or is in there. Right. The starch is going to enter that the whole uh, recipe now. So. All right, so I'm going to go in for a little bit of a taste to see if we need any more seasoning. Let's just hold on. I just want to cook off the flour because oh, okay. it just takes well, a minute or two to get the flour taste off. All right. All right, and yeah, go ahead and taste to see if we need to adjust seasoning at this point. Hmm. Is that good or bad? Hmm. I'm deciding. I think it needs a pinch of salt. And I think it needs a little pepper, honestly. I trust your taste buds. Go for it. She has a very good palate. She had she, her sense of smell and taste is awesome. Now this what we have right here is basically the base for clam chowder, uh, New England seafood chowder, any kind of a white chowder. Mm. How's it tasting? That's it. You want to taste? Nope. I trust your judgment. I just want to uh, mention one thing about the corn. The corn is going to add a natural sweetness to, to this, which is going to really bring it up to a whole nother level. Mm -hmm. If you have the time and you have the patience, what you could do before you start this whole before we start this mm -hmm. whole soup procedure is we can put this on a sheet pan with just a little bit nonstick spray, a little bit of seasoning, 
little a little spice if you want, whatever spice you like, and then toast it in the oven until it gets just a little tan. That brings out even more sweetness from the corn. Roasted corn. Roasted corn chowder. Mmm. I think this is more of a corn chowder than a... Yeah. It has a little bit of chicken in it. It's all right. And you can make it with no chicken. Yeah, from here, this base, you can add shrimp. You got a shrimp chowder, minus the carrots, classically. Clam, clam base, clam stock, clam chowder. It's good. It's good, right? All right, we're going to put it on the back stove. All righty. Hot behind you. Is the Monte Cristo. So, I always love to do the research, the food history um, of food. So I looked up the Monte Cristo. What did you discover? Well, I discovered that they really don't know who invented it. <laughs> no, that has to have been origin, original well, origin. Well, the original variation of it was French. It was called a croquet michou. That was, that's what it was called. And sometimes it was open. They used ham and Gruyere cheese. Mm, Gruyere cheese. Mm. It was baked. This sandwich is grilled, pan fried, or deep fried. We're not doing the deep fried one. The deep fried one they put in a batter. Um, so it was uh, invented on the West Coast and uh, in California. And then Disney made it very, very popular. It was in Disneyland. And they it became popular through them. But they were places through the Northwest and I think even the Midwest that they, they used it. Um, I always thought it was from New Orleans. And the reason why I thought it was from New Orleans is because I used to work at Bennigan's and they told me it was from New Orleans. <laughs> and Bennigan's had its own version of well, it. I was going to say, they probably had their own twist on it. It was like, that's, Plus yes. the French influence in New Orleans. Makes, yes. It makes sense. So, I mean, I did know of Monte Cristo's before that in the 70s, but I worked for Bennigan's in the 80s. Wait a minute. So let me understand. This. Sorry to interrupt you. So this was, this sandwich wasn't created by the Count of Monte Cristo? <laughs> I, <laughs> I had to go there. I just, I don't know. It was an so, open door. I learned that, you know, and the naming of it. Was it because it was the Monte Cristo Hotel? Or was it because it was the Count of Monte Cristo or the King of Monte Cristo? So there's a lot of different stories that go along with this sandwich. But basically, it, it started as a ham and cheese sandwich. And it's um, pressed and sauteed in a pan, but we're going to go a little lighter and do it on our George Foreman grill. And the recipes will vary. Some of them make it uh, just a regular sandwich, you know, two pieces of bread, but other ones make it three pieces of bread. And that's how we're going to make it. What we want to do, we have our bread and we have a teaspoon of mayo and a teaspoon it's not a teaspoon of mustard i put less and we just mix that together and we're gonna just slather that on to the three slices of bread one two and this one Flip over. Three. Better check on the soup. Make sure it's not sticking on the bottom. Stir your soup every now and then to make sure it's not sticking on the bottom. And it should be on really, really, really low because low. basically it is done already. It's just going to get a little bit thicker, but we don't want it to be cooking. Closer. We put cheese first. He's on the floor, but I don't think I need him. As you said, in this case, instead of Gurrier, we're using the uh, Swiss. We're using Swiss in this because we are using the George Foreman grill or a panini grill. Um, and it's not going to cook slow. It's going to cook fast. And Gruyere cheese takes a little while to melt. Then we're going to take two slices of ham, center it. Don't let it go too close to the edges because we're going to be cutting the edges off. Ham. 
and then I'm going to put another piece of cheese. This cheese was cut a little thin. I Next time I might have them cut it a little bit thicker because we want that gooeyness in there. But on a good side, it'll still finish and melt nice and evenly. It should. And then I'm going to put a the next piece of bread on top of that piece of bread. And again, we're going to put some cheese. Cut. You could cut the cheese to the size of the bread. I'm not going all the way out to the edges because, again, we're going to be cutting off the... I don't want to waste the cheese and stuff. I'm getting close, but... And then turkey. Now, I remember eating these sandwiches in the 70s. North Hills, they used to they used to make them. It was one of my favorites. It was right around the time that crepes were popular. popular. Yeah, yeah, kind of that French style cooking. Seemed very exotic at the time. All right, and then we're gonna put the lids on. And uh, now we're going to press yes, down on them. Absolutely. Okay? I was just going to say that. Okay. Don't know if it's in the recipe. It should be, but you want to press down it on it. definitely is in the recipe. You press down. My grandmother used to do that to all of our sandwiches. She used to take two hands. She used to press <laughs> hard down on them because she sent us to school with meatball sandwiches mm. on Italian bread. So she would just, so it wouldn't fall apart. And you, that's you the whole idea of it. You don't lose your meatball. You don't lose your meatball. Right. So... <laughs> <laughs> she is so cute. Chicken cutlet sandwiches, meatball sandwiches. So I'm not using a thick bread with this. Originally, I thought I was going to need to use the thick bread. Okay, now we're going to cut off the edges. Serrated knife. I'm going to come in here. I'm not going to cut too much of it off. That part is... Might leave a little crust on there, but that's okay. <laughs> now I am going to cut them in half because I do want them to get nice and battered up because we're going to dip these. The recipe calls for two eggs and about a third of a cup of milk or cream. To that, I'm just going to give a shake of nutmeg. It's like a pinch. And a little bit of vanilla. A little bit of vanilla. You know what she's making here, basically. This is a French uh, French toast batter, is what it is, really. Exactly. Exactly. There you go. Here's a little mini whip. So here's my mini whip. I'm going to whip it up. I just wanted to, to show you what it was like. You want to make sure. You, go ahead. Okay. You can use a pancake griddle. You could use a panini griddle. Or, as I said, you could deep fry them. So we want this to be nice and hot. The directions say to spray it with Crisco. I'm gonna use a little butter because I think that's gonna make it crisper. So basically this sandwich is like a French toast ham and cheese sandwich. So delicious. I would suggest besides the butter using a nonstick spray only because you're dipping a sandwich in a batter and you don't want it sticking to the grill and making a mess. Right. So you really want this sprayed and lubricated very well. Yes. The and grill. this is going to be a little bit of a messy part of this. All right, so you know what? We let's will. Get a, let's get a dish you can carry over. You know what I mean? Actually, I'll just move the sandwiches over. How's that? I'll give you a little plate that'll catch all the droppings. Okay. Well, I could go right like this, babe. I have it. I have it. Okay. Oh, okay. The pan will yeah, catch it. That's pan, perfect. It'll just be. Perfect. Try not to dirty dishes. This Even is a, this is the I don't, difference. This I is don't difference. dirty. I don't wash the dishes. He does, but I still try let to use as few let dishes me explain as possible. This. In our kitchen, because we both work in the food service industry, we have different ways of doing. It takes me an hour to put out a meal for the family, but everything's cleaned up. She can bang out that same meal in twenty-five minutes, and we're we're eating dinner. But there's a little wreckage at the end of it. I'm getting better. She's getting better. Yes. Make sure it's hot. Now, if you're doing this on a pancake griddle, you want it on a very low temperature so that the bread doesn't burn because it's not, 
it's not being seared on both sides at the same time. You could even kind of maybe put a lid on top of it. So I'm going to go. I'm going to put some butter down. I'm going to take my sandwich. I'm going to soak it in this. It's kind of like custard. That's what they kept calling it in. And I want to make sure I get all the sides. I haven't had one of these in years. I'm so excited. All right, here it goes. And we'll close this up while I dip the next one. Actually, I'm going to do a few of them at the same time. Yeah, if you're making multiple sandwiches, I put all the sandwiches that you can fit on a grill at one time, then close the lid. Yeah. It, it might stick. It may or may not stick. We'll see when we open it to put the other sandwiches on. Right, right. It's true. You don't want them, though, to sit in the batter too long. No, because then you'll have a soggy mess. Ready? I know, right? Whoa. Okay, close that up. I love my George Foreman grill. Love it. I had it for like three years and never used it. Yeah, I was kind of snobbish about it when I first saw it. I said, ah, what kind of a grill can that be? It's really good. Really good. It, um, but the only thing is, it's either on or off. There's no temperature to it. Okay. So while that's cooking, I'll tell you a little something else. When these come off, we're going to cut them in quarters, and they are served with preserves, uh, raspberry preserves, uh, you know, apricot, strawberry. I've always had them with raspberry, and they're sprinkled with powdered sugar, so it really is like a breakfast sandwich, a great item for brunch. But if you wanted to make this a little more savory, you could break off fresh basil leaves or even spinach and put this in the middle of a sandwich. Mm. And it would take it from the sweetness side that it's going to be into a savory sweet, especially the basil part. The basil, fresh basil leaves in a sandwich. I'm just thinking, I'm thinking of my, my grilled cheese class that I do or my panini classes. We can make like a fusion mm -hmm. and do any flavor you want. You exactly. can do a tomato mozzarella with a little prosciutto. Right. Uh, you know, just make any kind of flavor that you want in there. Um, be creative and use different types of bread. Like our chowder, always... like our chowder. It's very versatile. Yes. If you were using a griddle, you would have to turn them after about three to three, three or four minutes. The idea is, is that these are going to come out and they're going to be nice and gooey on the inside with that cheese. And use your nose. I can smell I the can ham. I can smell it. I can smell the ham and the cheese. And I can smell the uh, the French toast. The batter part, yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's take a peek. <gasps> wow. I think that's it. The cheese is melting. Yeah. Yes. That's a beautiful thing. Yeah, put them on here first. It was a very important making sure the grill was really lubricated, either with spray or butter or both. Mm-hmm. Okay, put that, put this one on. Okay. I'm gonna sit this up like this. Sit this one on here. Serve it with some chili and some powdered sugar. And then we're going to take a cup of soup. Yeah, this is this is more like a stew, this soup. A soup with our Monte Cristo. Sandwich. Oh yeah, much better. You can see it. Cup of soup, a Monte Cristo sandwich, and classical raspberry. 
So, from our kitchen to yours, with love and, and creativity. creativity, thanks for joining us and have a great night. And bon Stay appetit. well. Bon Take appetit. Care.